Hi everyone and welcome back to the Redeemed Roots channel. I'm Mackenzie and today we're going to be looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 20 as part of our Relevant series. And the idea of the Relevant series is to look at Old Testament books of the Bible, specifically the histories, and see how these stories apply to our lives today and what application we can draw from them. So the first story that we're going to be looking at is about King Jehoshaphat. So if you open in your Bible so that you can follow along with me as I go through this discussion, today we're going to be specifically looking at verses 1 through 13. So it says, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Meonites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already at Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Engedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and began to speak. So the first thing I want to look at in verses 1 through 5 is what happens and how Jehoshaphat responds to hearing this news that three giant armies are coming to attack the people of Judah. So at this time, the Israelites have been split up into the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms. And we're fo focusing in this passage in the kingdom of Judah, which is one of the southern kingdoms. And the kingdom of, of Judah had a better reputation for seeking God and following God than the northern kingdoms did. Um, and even at this point, though the kingdom of Judah have had some problems, they have a king, Jehoshaphat now, uh, who is seeking God uh, and is described as a good king. And we see that he's described as a good king, actually, in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, if you want to go back and read over that. Um, it says that he was a person who um, sought after the Lord uh, and pleased the Lord. Um, and we know that the life of Jehoshaphat and was honoring to God, specifically because of this passage that's recorded in 2 Chronicles. Um, and the very first thing that King Jehoshaphat does when he hears this news is he resolves to inquire of the Lord. And literally in the Hebrew, that phrase is he gave his face to seek Yahweh. Um, and not only did Jehoshaphat give his face to seek Yahweh, he also declared a fast for all the people of Judah and led others in seeking God too. And there's two things that I, I really want to draw from those passages. And the first is that whenever we are faced with a problem or difficulty, what is the very first response that we have? Is it seeking God? And when we seek God, are we seeking God just for God's help? Or are we seeking God for the face of God? And that's really something that I want to highlight in this passage. I want you to think about over the course of your life when you've had problems and, and difficulties and situations that you didn't know what to do with and you decided that you were going to seek God. Did you seek God because you wanted the help of God or you wanted the wisdom of God? You just wanted God to make it right? Or did you really want God? Um, and in this passage, Jehoshaphat displays the fact that he wants God. Not only does he want the help of God, it says he inquires for the help of God and the wisdom of God. But more than that, he wants God and he wants the presence of God. And that's what his soul longs for. And then we should be the same way. When we come to God with a problem, we should want God, not just the solution that God gives us, but God himself. And then also... He's the king at this time, and in order to be a good leader, especially a good spiritual leader, we also have to be people who lead others to seek God as well. Uh, so not only does, God, does Jehoshaphat seek God in his own time, but he also declares a fast for the people of Judah so that they can be led into seeking God with him as well. Um, and these opportunities that God gives us when he, when he puts difficult situations in our lives are really chances for us to be able to point uh, everything back to God and for us to begin to look to God and to seek God, but then also direct others, that that is what their response should be in their scenarios as well. To seek God first. And not only to seek God for his help, but to seek God for who he is. Uh, and so then after he does this, he stands up in front of the assembly, in front of all these people, uh, at the front of the courtyard, and begins this prayer. And I want to spend the next part of uh, this discussion focused on this prayer and how Jehoshaphat praise to God. Many of you might have heard of the Acts model of prayer before, and it starts out with adoration, and then moves to confession, and then thanksgiving, and then supplication, and it's a way that we can get our minds and hearts focused on God and what He wants to speak, speak and say to us. Um, and 
I really think that Second Chronicles 20 provides an example of a similar model of prayer because he starts out in verse 6 saying, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms and nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. And really what Jehoshaphat does from the very beginning is he acknowledges the power of God. He remembers the power of God. And when we have a problem in our own lives, the very first thing that we should do is seek God, but then remember the God that we are seeking, that He has power and He has might, and He's the only one who's going to be able to, to change the outcome of the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and then in verse 7, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham? Um, your friends, they lived in it and they built a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand before you in your presence and in this temple that bears your name. And we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear and save us. And then the second part, there's two things that Joseph had also does. He remembers the promises of God um, and the provision of God. And we see that he remembers the provision of God because he drove out the inhabitants of the land before the people of Israel and gave it to them forever. Um, and, and God was powerful, but then he also was willing to be able to reach into the situations and scenarios of his people uh, and, and interact with it and, and change it. Um, and so when we come to God, we are not only remembering that he's all-powerful, but we're also remembering that God is working in that situation that he's providing just as he has in the past. Uh, recalling the past provision of God uh, is such an important thing for us to do whenever we have these times of, of prayer. We remember the power of God specifically because we know he has, how he's been faithful and how he's provided for us in the past. Uh, and then also the promises of God. And um, in that last part in uh, verse 9, it, it talks about you will hear and save us. And so he recalls this promise that, that God has made to them in Second Chronicles seven fourteen. And he's kind of drawing upon this as, as he prays this out loud to God. And so praying scripture, praying to God, the promises of God, is such an important thing to do. And I think it's something that as we are looking at how to pray powerfully and how to pray powerful prayers, that you should consider incorporating in your own life as well. And then look at verse 10. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. Here they are repaying us by coming to drive out, drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And so in this next part, I want us to really look at, uh, he, he moves, he acknowledges the power of God and the, the presence of God in the situation, his provision and his promises. Um, and now... Jehoshaphat is looking to God in complete and total humility, recognizing his own powerlessness to do anything in this situation. Um, and he knows that God is going to be good and that God is going to do what is right in this situation. And so he goes to God saying, God, like, look, look at what you've done to these people on the past. And, and these people are not people who fear you or fear your name. And we are the people of Israel, the people of Judah, and we do. We worship you. Um, and... And in the middle of the situation, we're coming to you and we're seeking you. Um, but we can't do anything. And we have no power. And all the power belongs to you. And it's also really important that when we come to God with our requests, that we come to God in the humility that comes from realizing that we have no power to change the situation. But we worship a God who has the power to change the situation. And I want us to remember this and to take this with us as we go and we bring these problems before God. No, we may not know what to do. But we keep our eyes on Him, the one who does know what to do, who already has it planned, who is good and is already working, as we're going to see in the next part of our series. And so, verse 13 says that all the men of Judah, everybody's standing there, and we kind of get this dramatic pause as we brought this request before God, and now we don't know what's going to happen. How is God going to respond to this? What should the direction be? I also want to take a sidebar and mention the same concept of seeking God, because really the overarching theme of this whole chapter is about seeking God and what that looks like. 
Um, and I want you to begin thinking about that over the next couple weeks. What does it mean to seek God and, and how do you do it? I will publish a video that talks exactly about what it means to seek God. Uh, because for some of you, it might be different than what you anticipated. So I look forward to you tuning in for that one. And I'll see you next time on the Redeemer's Vlog. Bye.